do we need a fellowship advisor? And the questions that I think we're going to aim to answer is, well, you know, how can an internet platform primarily be evidence-based? How can we, um, you know, think about this tool that they've created called My Fellowship? Um, ultimately, think about mentorship and how important that is. <laughs> and then really, from their perspective, <laughs> what it is that these two individuals did with respect to becoming authors, developing a digital platform, and then ultimately telling a little bit about what this tool is called BMET. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Dr. Mohi Taha, who is an orthopedic consultant, shoulder and elbow surgeon in Basel uh, in Switzerland. Welcome, Mohi. How are you? Thanks, Mo. Thanks for the invitation. It has been a great pleasure to be here online. I would also like to welcome um, PD Dr. Uh, Alexander Lederman. He is also a shoulder and elbow surgeon in Geneva in Switzerland. He has been um, around for a couple of more years before me. Uh, he's also one of my mentors where I also visited as a fellow. And that's also the beginning of our relation as he came to Australia while I was a fellow over there. And that was five years ago. That's how we started to know each other and um, developed a friendship, not only a mentorship, but also a that friendship for lifetime. Good. Um, so we can start with uh, presenting the idea and that platform, my fellowship or myfellowship.com. Um, if you have a look and ask yourself, what are uh, the values you are looking for? Or what's your um, quotation that you live and think of it's important? So for me, that was the importance of education. Even in, during the school, during my medical school, after that, um, it was very important that to look for the best education. Next, please. So starting my residency actually in Cairo, I started my university degree in Cairo after finishing my university degree in Cairo. Uh, after my fourth year, I took a year break and I went for my very first research fellowship where I stayed in lab and try to learn about evidence-based in lab and how to do experiments. Um, and that's what my first relation with evidence-based and the first relation with um, all of the experience of doing research on scientific basis and not only reading books about research, which, I, which happens from other people, but to create this research and to create the studies yourself. And the journey from Cairo till Basel here, it took some stops in different countries. So it was been uh, full of uh, fellowships in total of five uh, full-time fellowships. First one was in Berlin, as I mentioned, then I was in the AO Foundation as well in uh, Dubendorf doing my clinical research fellowship. And that was the first time I got introduced to Mo Bandari. Uh, through uh, Laura Odige and Beata Hansen, who were my mentors during that fellowship. And they did actually a, a lot of work with uh, Professor Bandari. That's the first time I got in contact with him indirectly. So it's also a part of mentorship through digital world and through publications. And then it took me to uh, Brazil where I did my trauma fellowship and uh, to Australia where I did two fellowships in shoulder and elbow surgery. Next. If you took a look, have a look at your medical career, when you start, you start as a medical student. And this is also a very important time because that's where you develop the basic knowledge, which would help you with your career. So you don't underestimate the medical student because medical students from today they are the residents for tomorrow. They are the consultants of after tomorrow. At some time, they are the professors themselves. So you need to um, discover the potential of these students from the early days as well. And after finishing medical school, six years or four years, depending on the program you're reaching, and then you start your internship. And that's the first time where you really do practical and implement all of the a theoretical knowledge which you acquired over a couple of years. Then you come a residence where you choose your speciality and do all of the training which you will use for the following 30 or 40 years of work. And to 
um, residency is usually a general residency where you have a broad spectrum of your specialty. And then today it comes to the subspeciality where everybody uh, tries to have his own subspeciality to be an expert in this. And that's where the important role of a fellowship comes. And that's where you differentiate yourself from other colleagues where you have your own subspeciality. And interestingly, once you finish your specialty, then you are a fellowship trained consultant, but your journey doesn't end, it just begins. And here I always think about the three T's, which is to treat your patient, teach your students and train your colleagues. So instead of being a fellow, you try and start training fellows. And that's where you start mentoring people instead of always looking and going beside mentors. Next, please. So everybody likes the idea of being a fellow or having a fellowship, but what are the problems when you start looking for a fellowship? One of these main problems is there are plenty of different fellowships available worldwide, every website or lots of institutes, lots of have their own website, lots of organizations offer fellowships. And the problem is when you start applying, you don't really have a feedback about the fellowships available. You don't know what to expect. And there is sometimes a gap between the fellowship providers and their expectations and between the fellows or the future fellows who are looking for a fellowship and they don't know what to expect. And that leads to frustration. You see some examples here of Sydney Slaves as a WhatsApp group or somebody who is really frustrated about his fellowship in one of the foreign countries, foreign to him. And if you don't have enough preparation, if you don't have, if you don't take an um, informed decision before you go on a fellowship, that could be the frustration you face. Next. So what, how did I do it? How did I try to avoid um, frustration in my fellowships in Australia? So it was a time, it was, 2013, where I thought about applying for a fellowship for year 2016. So three years in advance, I started thinking about the idea, contacting different um, fellowship providers, asking them about the system and if I can come and visit them to talk to them and to talk to uh, current fellows. And 2013, I went there, I had like 13 interviews which cost me like four weeks of holidays and more than $10,000 just to get there and to do my research. And um, at the end of the day, I only applied to four fellowships out of the 13 which I visited because the others, it's not being better or worse fellowship or a better fellowship. It's about what is the system there? What are their expectations? What are my expectations? And to take an informed decision and find the right match which will avoid you a lot of money and frustration in the future. And out of these four, four fellowships, I went and did two of them in Australia. Next. So to avoid the frustration and going through the journey, through applying for the fellowship, all of the paperwork, all of the, um, the path, because from the time you get accepted to a fellowship, it doesn't, uh, it's not the end. It's again a beginning of a new journey, which is to get to that place. And that's where I started to write down all of the steps I had to take, which documents I needed, which um, fees you have to pay, where to get your license, all of that stuff. I put it out in a book. I gave it to my fellowship provider and tell them, okay, when somebody applies to you, then you can give them that book so that they can learn from it and avoid doing the same mistakes and going through the same pitfalls. And then years ago, a year after I thought like, okay, why don't I make it available for everybody? And then I published it on Amazon. So it became out of the need that people were asking me, how did you go to Australia? How did you do your fellowship? What steps do we need to do? And that's how I came with the idea of this book. Next. Then comes to the idea, okay, we had that idea that this problem is not only my own problem, but lots of fellows around the world go through the same problem. 
And then we had the idea, okay, is it a global problem? Do we really need a fellowship advisor? And that's where we started to do our research and we started to um, send a questionnaire out and do a survey to ask surgeons and internal medicine and different specialities if they really want uh, such a fellowship advisor. Next. And if you look at the results of our survey, that's what you see fellowship is big part of it is a mentorship, other part of it is the training itself, and the third part is the traveling. And the problem is first uh, one is to find a suitable fellowship, then to find the feedback from fellows who has been there, who have done it before you, then being able to connect to these fellows who has been there before you, and then after that, um, getting the finances, uh, financial support to do, go and do the fellowship itself. And we found that most of the people has a problem with um, finding this fellowship. So our solution is to create a database for them to find these fellowships. We have developed standardized feedback so that people who are in there who get there, he can get a feedback about that fellowship and ask the person who wrote that fellow feedback about their experience, then they can contact each other and they can apply for financial support as well. Next. So the platform, we try to make everybody happy. We try to make the fellowship providers happier. We try to make the previous, the future fellows happier and the previous fellows allows them also to mentor the future fellows. Next. So for the future fellows, they have a database where they can search for a fellowship. They can connect to other doctors on the platform. They can find a mentor and they can apply for financial support. For the institutes themselves, they can provide a fellowship. They can um, get the unbiased feedback about the fellowship and the um, opportunities they are providing. And um, they can also have less administration because people who are much more and quicker and more efficient informed about the deadlines, about the required documents, about all of the requirements about the fellowship himself. And the previous fellows, they can share the experience which they gathered through their fellowship. They can connect to other doctors and they have the opportunity to mentor the new fellows. And at some stage they can provide the fellowship as well by themselves. Next. So when you start any new project, you ask yourself, what is the value of this project? Why I am doing this project? What, what is the added value to the people around me? Is it really essential or not? And we also did the research before we started the project. And now when we look at the results after one year, we have more than 20,000 visits to the website. We have about 1,000 uh, registrations. We have about 280, um, more than 280 fellowships and people checking our website from more than 150 countries. Next. So it is a big project. We didn't start, uh, you cannot do anything alone by yourself. So what we start, we started collaborations with people from all over the world. We are supported by the Association of uh, Medical Residents and Consultants in Switzerland who are promoting education and fellowships around the world. We have BMED represented by Dr. Alex Lederman who will be talking after me and plenty of other uh, institutes from around the world. Next. So all of those who are interested, it is for free. They can join the platform. You can use it from your mobile phone or from your computer. Just go to myfellowship.com, log in, and then you can sign and you will get also a free copy of my book, A Roadmap to Australian Fellowship. Next. And much more stories and all of the whole uh, career and how did I do it and why and when and what was the motivation. You can all read about it from uh, my book, uh, The Swiss Made Egyptian, because this also came out as people were asking me, uh, what's your story? What's your story behind this platform? How did you came up with that idea? 
why? How can you do something like that? You are actually a doctor in a full-time job. So I did write all of it together and published it in that book. And then now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Alexander Letterman, who will take over from here and introduce PMET and uh, how it's connected with my fellowship. Thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. So uh, I am the founder of PMED. I am an orthopedic sur uh, surgeon. Uh, I do mainly short and elbow surgery. Um, I'm still at the University Hospital working at uh, around 10%, but most of my practice is um, in, in private institution. Nevertheless, I still um, publish uh, a lot and still uh, teach at university. I am a PD, it means it's like associate professor. So I have to go regularly to, um, to the Faculty of Medicine in order to teach. And I realized this last year that uh, I, I had some, some problems, mainly three problems. Next. So the, the first problem is publication. Um, I publish something like 15 articles on PubMed per year. And the first problem that it, it's quite time consuming. And as you know, time is money. Um, as I'm not completely fluent in English, uh, some people have to review my article and this can also cost money. I have to pay for illustration, for statistic. Um, from time to time, we even have to pay for submission because it's not always free of charge. You need to pay if you want to, if you want to be published in open access, you have to pay for publication. And when it's accepted, holy grail, great, but almost nothing belongs to you anymore. And this is a big problem. So the process of scientific publication is according to me quite rotten and nothing has changed since the last uh, century. Next slide. My second problem is teaching. Um, so as I told you, I teach regularly at the university and I will just give you one example. Uh, it was uh, a course that I was giving the 16th of no uh, November, 2019. And I had in front of me 20 students. They all had computer and the university gave me a book to do this, uh, this course. And I, I studied this book 20 years before when, um, I was preparing my uh, examination of medicine, meaning that in 20 years, absolutely nothing has changed at the university. I had in front of me a limited number of students. Um, they all had their computer. I just had the book. While well, the teaching that I give is quite ephemeral, meaning that when I finish my course, nothing is uh, actually accessible. You cannot find it anymore. It's a local teaching, it's not global. And as I said, it's uh, a little bit obsolete. And the third point, and I don't have any slide for this, but the, the third problem is learning. How do you learn medicine today? If you want to learn about the subject, you will go on PubMed and you need to read something like 30 to 40 uh, articles if you want to understand something. Each article can cost up to uh, $30. So it, it means quite a lot of money. Uh, you can also buy a book, but you need to realize that the writing of the book began something like four years before. So as soon as you buy a book, it's already obsolete. Um, you can, if you want to learn a technique, you can go on ViewMed, uh, on ViewMedi, for example. It's a platform where you can, form, you can find um, nice video. However, it's like a little bit like the Library of Babel. It's very difficult to find the video because everybody wants to have his own video on, on, uh, on ViewMedi. So there are too many videos. Very difficult to find the, the, right, the right one. You can go to the website up to date, but it's only bullet points. So it, it's not a global teaching. Uh, um, on Wikipedia, the, the auto part is not very well developed. It's not really integrated. The e-learning is not integrated in medicine. So this is the three problems that I, I observed when I was doing this teaching and trying to learn something. Next. Next slide, please. So yeah. 
So we decided to, to create uh, a participative encyclopedia, exactly like uh, Wikipedia, but at the beginning for, for, for medicine, but at, at the beginning for orthopedic surgery. And the, the skeleton is a, a free participative encyclopedia, meaning that everybody can, if you have a good idea, you can publish your idea right away. And this is control exactly like in Wiki. So you cannot put everything you want on the website. It has to be control and this is control. But if you become a valuable reviewer, then you can implement and add everything that you want. And this is, uh, this is participative. There is a lot of reviewer, meaning that the content is rather neutral and usually very correct. We have for this, um, uh, for every chapter, bullet points. A uh, funny thing that is, uh, that are anecdotes. Nobody published anecdotes and that's what make our, our, our job funny and uh, I decided to, uh, to offer the opportunity to publish them. We also put some book of reference, like for shoulder surgery, the book of Codman. And now the nice thing is that for every chapter, you have nice illustrations, selected ones, but you, you also have selected videos, meaning that if somebody has a very nice video of one technique, we take the best one and we just decide that this is the video that has to be uh, shown for a better teaching. And then for each chapter, you have multiple choice questions. So it's not only like Wiki where you just read and maybe from time to time have a, a nice figure. You have nice illustration, but also videos and multiple choice questions to test your knowledge. So this is really a global teaching platform. Next. So the idea was to put everything together. Uh, everything exists already. You, there is PubMed, there is the congresses, Wikipedia, Head to Toe, uh, ViewMedi, Bullets, uh, Auto Bullets up to date. And if you put everything together, you have VMed. Next slide. So this is how it works. So this is, for example, the, the Wiki part. Uh, and as I said, you have a lot of chapter and Every chapter is quite well described, and this is a participative one. If you register, you can, you can really add everything that you want. Next slide. And of course, we, we have so the wiki, but also e-congresses, and uh, we are a little bit surfing on the COVID um, wave because all the, the, the Congress has been canceled, so we organize all big Congress that, that we can. We, we have uh, we organize the biggest, uh, the, the largest shoulder congress of the world, the Nice Shoulder Course. This is next month. We will organize the uh, European Shoulder and Elbow Congress and so on and so on. And e-congress are really practical for busy doctors. Uh, I spend two months per year uh, in congresses and this is definitely too much. We have more and more problems with uh, compliance. So e-congress solve this kind of problem. This is an ecological way to learn because it, uh, it avoids, you know, a very long trip. And as you know, this is virusless. Next slide. Um, so yeah, this is the, the app that, that we have, for example, for the, the next niche on the course. Next slide. And what we do is we, we try to, to do an, an education, but this is only a theoretical education. VMED uh, teach the doctor, the, back, the doctors put very good ideas on VMED, VMED teach uh, the student. So this is really a theoretical education. And we, di we didn't have the practical teaching. And the nice thing to collaborate with Moi is that Moi has the perfect platform to organize this practical teaching in order to have the best teaching uh, that, you can, that you can imagine. 